Welcome back to another episode of 2021's Worm Week, and to another episode of Animal of the Week. Last Worm Week, the animal we did was the Antarctic Scale Worm, a truly monstrous worm from the depths of the frozen Antarctic Sea, so if you want to go and check that out, you can right here. This time, we've tried to live up to the truly terrifying nature of the Antarctic Scale Worm by choosing this, the Pompeii Worm. Just like the Antarctic Scale Worm, this worm is a deep sea polychaete or bristle worm. Though terrifying to look at, they are only around 13 centimetres in length, so not too big. They are part of the family Alvinellidae, which contains nine other species. They get this name from the DSV Alvin, a US Navy deep sea submersible that discovered many deep sea thermal vents and the creatures that survived off them back in the 1970s and 80s. The common name Pompeii worm is a reference to the habitat in which they live. They were first discovered by two French oceanographers in 1980 on a hydrothermal vent in the Pacific Ocean near the Galapagos Islands, but have since been found in other places in the Eastern Pacific region. These vents spew out black smoke and minerals from deep down in the earth, which is why they are called the Pompeii Worm, a reference to the events that unfolded when Mount Vesuvius erupted, destroying Pompeii in 79 AD, because hydrothermal vents look like little volcanoes and sometimes act like them. They live in strange tubes built onto the seafloor near to these vents, and will generally live in large colonies next to other members of the species. The minerals spewed out by them support complex ecosystems in otherwise dark and barren ocean floor deserts, and the Pompeii worm has become very well adapted to living in these conditions, but I'll say more on that in the adaptation section. The Pompeii worm only sticks its head out of its tube to feed and also to breathe. It feeds upon any small microbes in the water that have been cultured by the hydrothermal vents. It uses its feather-like head to capture these microbes in the water. Strangely, these feather structures are also their gills that they use to breathe with. Such a stationary feeding process means they are completely reliant upon the hydrothermal vents they live near. What we know of their breeding techniques is limited but satisfactory for this video. We know that they do have distinct males and females and are not hermaphrodites, and they do reproduce sexually. It's thought that because they live in such close quarters to each other that they reproduce through proper couplings and don't just release gametes into the water column. My guess as to why they would do this would be so that the gametes do not get destroyed by the immensely hot water or also the immensely cold water of the habitat they live in. These worms have adaptations so amazing that scientists are studying them to try and mimic them. The main extraordinary adaptation is their ability to survive extreme heat. They are the second most heat-resistant complex animal after the tardigrade, as they can survive temperatures up to over 100 degrees Celsius, whereas the tardigrade can survive around 150 degrees Celsius. However, this is very extreme, and generally they only live in 20 to 80 degrees. How on earth do they do this, you may ask? Well, that's what scientists are so fascinated about. They have a symbiotic relationship with bacteria that grows to about 1 cm thick on their skin. This bacteria insulates them from the extreme temperature allowing them to survive. The Pompeii worm then releases a mucus made of various nutrients they've collected to feed the bacteria and keep it healthy. Another thing they do is distribute heat in their bodies very efficiently. Because their tails are closest to the vents, they get very hot, but their mouths sit at around 22 degrees, allowing them to dissipate the extreme heat. This has implications for a wide number of industries, from pharmaceutical to clothing, but they are hard to study as none have survived the decompression when brought to the surface. Another adaptation is the previously mentioned breathing technique, using their strange feather-like appendages to extract the oxygen from the water. All those little bristles on their head are actually gills and get the reddish colour from the haemoglobin in the blood that passes through them. They use diffusion to obtain this oxygen, similar to how fish gills work. We don't know if they have any predators. This deep down is probably unlikely and humans pose no threat because of the isolation. Temperature is their main threat, but they have adapted to this well. Overall, we have no idea about their population size or their trend, but let's hope they are thriving. Well, that's it for the Pompeii Worm, and I hope you've enjoyed the first video of Worm Week 2021. Tune in tomorrow when we'll be investigating the case of 40,000-year-old nematodes surviving being frozen in permafrost. You won't want to miss it. Thanks for watching.